Let's have revival from the pulpit to the pew. Let's have revival that starts with me and you, then reaches out to a lost and hungry world to bring them in. This is our joy. It's our survival. Let's pray for a Holy Ghost arrival. Let's have a revival. I asked an old time preacher how revival came back there. He said we always started down on our knees in prayer. Just open up those two books, the song again, the Bible. If you sing and preach the word, you'll have a revival. Let's have a revival. From the pulpit to the pew, let's have a revival. That starts with me and you, then reaches out to a lost and hungry world to bring them in. This is our joy. It's our survival. Let's pray for a Holy Ghost arrival. Let's have a revival. Sometimes we've just gone through the motions, left the spirit out. No power in our program, no victory in our shout. But God will give us back the joy. Let's open up the Bible, lay aside formality. Let's have a revival. Let's have a revival. From the pulpit to the pew, let's have a revival. That starts with me and you. Then reaches out to a lost and hungry world to bring them in. This is our joy. It's our survival. Let's pray for a Holy Ghost arrival. Let's have a revival.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. seems to hide his face I rest in his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil
I want to introduce today our Arkansas Youth Alive missionary, Chris Bradley, and I'm going to tell you, he and his wife, Tasha, are two of the sweetest people that you will ever meet in your entire lives, 
and uh, he has uh, he has such a heart for youth. I have such a heart for youth. We need God to move in our youth here in this church and in this town. We really do. And uh, so I am delighted to introduce to you Brother Chris Bradley. Would you give him a great big mean Arkansas welcome today? Like Pastor said, my name is Chris, and my wife Tasha and I, we are the missionaries to the public schools of Arkansas. And sometimes I get kind of a strange look when I say that because you're like, okay, so you're not having to eat any kind of weird food, right? All right, the public schools of Arkansas, you know, hamburgers, pizza, yeah. God's blessed us there. Thank the Lord for that. But when you think about the public schools, it's a very strategic, very important mission field. Matter of fact, out of the 350 million people that are in our country today talking about the United States of America, 20% of our nation's population is tied to our public schools, whether they are a student or a school district employee. In most of our Arkansas communities, our public schools here in Arkansas are the most concentrated mission field in our communities. Our public schools, I mean, I can say this anywhere in Arkansas, and it's very diverse all across our state, and all of our schools are very different, but our public schools in this state encompass every demographic in that local community like no other entity in that area. We need to be reaching our schools. Why? Why is that important? Well, because according to some studies and some experts, people that are a lot smarter than me, they tell us that the millennial generation, which we're, you know, we're not even talking about the millennials much anymore, but the churches in this country only reached about four to six percent of the millennials in this nation. Now that's significant because when you look at our country today, and I don't have to you know, spend a lot of time. It's not necessarily a, uh, you know, it's not the Democrats' fault or the Republicans' fault. Come on, somebody. We, we have a problem in this country, right? And the problem is, is that we have a generation that's currently in this nation that doesn't know God nor His ways. And it's very familiar because if you go back and you look in the book of Judges, as a matter of fact, I believe it's Judges chapter 2. I'm not going to go there this morning, but you'll, you'll find real quickly that the very generation that followed Joshua's generation as Joshua entered into the promised land and he led the Israelites into the promised land and they did great things. One of the greatest, uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest generations that's ever walked the planet. The very generation that came after them, the Bible says in Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Matter of fact, verse number 10, it says that there arose a generation that didn't know God nor His ways. The point that I'm trying to say is that if we want to see our nation turned around, yes, we need to pray. Yes, we need revival inside the house. Yes, 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 and yes to all of that. But we have to understand that we have to go to where they are, and we have to be the church not just in here, but we have to be the church out there. Amen? And so this morning, I want to challenge you with that. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I pray that you still love me after we're done today. But I'm going to push on you a little bit because we are facing epidemic situations and issues in our nation. And it's not just about who's in the White House. And I believe that we need to be involved. And I believe that we need to vote. You need to vote. You need to pray. But we need to be winning our communities for the kingdom of God. Amen? We have what they need. Amen? And we need to be the difference with the help of the Holy Spirit. So if you have the scriptures with you this morning, two verses of scripture that I'm going to just kind of talk about real quickly. And then I will get into what we do in Youth Alive and how we can partner together to impact our schools in Arkansas. Matthew chapter 28, 19 very familiar passage of scripture and then also Mark 16 15 Matthew 28 19 most of the time most everyone calls this the Great Commission this is Jesus speaking he says therefore go and make disciples of all nations turn to your neighbor and say the word nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit we've been called to go where to the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the the Holy Spirit. Flip over to Mark 16, 15. Very similar, but just a little bit different. And I want to kind of highlight this in our reading this morning. This is Jesus again speaking. And he said unto them, 
Go into all the world. Turn to your other neighbor and say, world. And preach the good news to all creation. We are to go to the nations and we are to go to the world. Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity just to be in this house, Lord. And, and God, just with this faith family this morning, Father, I lift up Miss Pam. And Lord, I lift up everyone in this house, Lord, that's sick and afflicted right now. And I declare healing over their body in Jesus' name. It's by your stripes that we are healed. And we lay claim to that heritage of healing that we have through you right now, Lord, on behalf of everyone that's not feeling well today. And Lord, as we spend the next few moments just gathered around your word, I just ask God that you would give us revelation, give us insight, so that we can leave this house today, Lord, being built up in our most holy faith, Lord, equipped to do the work of the ministry outside these walls. And I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I want to talk to you for just a few moments this morning on the commission that Jesus gave us as Christ followers. Now notice that I said Christ followers. This is not just for the pastors or the preachers or, or you know what, even the deacons or the Sunday school teachers or the trustees, but as a Christ follower, all of us have been commissioned, right? All of us have been commissioned. And Jesus gives us basically two verses of Scripture here that are very important when it comes to us fulfilling our purpose with our life on this side of eternity. But did Jesus really mean for every single person who is a Christ follower, who has surrendered their heart and life to uproot their family, to leave Polk County? I'm from Polk County, so that's kind of, you know, kind of different for me to say. But, but... But, but to leave their community, to leave their home, to just uproot everything and to go to the other side of the world. You know what? For some people, yes, he did. For some people, he has called them to, to go to Asia or to go to Africa. And I'm so thankful for those individuals who have answered that call. And, and church, can I tell you this this morning? That as I stand before you this morning, the assemblies of God are in more nations all over this planet than the United Nations. Come on, somebody. That's right. There are actually some places on the planet today where you have Coca-Cola and you have a McDonald's and then you have the Assemblies of God. And I like all three of those, right? Amen. But we live in a nation that's at a crossroads. You guys watch the news, I'm sure. And many of you, and I, I, I'm not going to call you old timers, but many of you more seasoned saints in this house today, you look at what you see in our nation today, and it's a very different place than how you grew up. It's a different place. What went wrong? What happened? It's not that we don't have churches on every corner. I don't know how many churches are in this area, but I can tell you that in the United States of America, there's over 400,000 evangelical churches alone. That really constitutes to a church being almost on every single street corner in our country. But yet you see the direction that our country is heading. Come on. You see the different decisions that we're making. And church, you even see the different laws that maybe are trying to be passed, different things that are, that are taking place all over our land. And it makes you think, Lord, what in the world is going on? It's not that we don't have churches everywhere. It's not that we don't have great ministries. It's that we've stopped being the church around those that we work with. We've stopped being the church around those that we live next to. We've stopped being the church in our communities. It's one thing to sing the songs, to pray the prayers, to preach the messages in here, but it's another thing to go outside and to show them, not just share our faith, but to show our faith by how we live our life. And this is exactly what Jesus is telling us here in Matthew chapter 28 and also in Mark chapter 16. So let's get into this. In Matthew chapter 28, 19, I had you guys actually repeat the word nations. And the Greek word for nations is the word ethos. And this is where we get our word ethnic. In Greek, this word is always used to describe Gentile nations. However, it doesn't just refer to nations that are geographically located distant from us. But this also expresses the ideas of different customs, different cultures, and different civilizations. When Jesus uttered the words in Matthew 28, 19 to 
go and make disciples of every nation, he was telling us that we, as his followers, are to impact every custom, every culture, every civilization on this planet. It doesn't matter if they talk like us. It doesn't matter if they look like us. It doesn't matter if they, if they live where we live. We have a mandate from heaven as a Christ follower to impact with the same gospel that's touched our lives every custom, every culture, every single civilization. In Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, I had you guys repeat the word world. And this word is very significant in the Greek because the Greek word for world here is the word cosmos. And this is a word that describes anything that is ordered, anything that is ordered. In the Greek, it's often used to denote a particular political system, a system of fashion, a system found in any part of society, such as a circle of friends or any sphere where you live or have influence. This could be considered a cosmos this morning because you know that every single Sunday at this particular time there's going to be a group of people that meet here but you have to understand that Jesus didn't just tell us who to reach every custom every culture every civilization Matthew 28 19 but he also told us where to find them every single world system that creates culture now let me kind of break it down for you like this so that we're all on the same page in our American culture, we have different world systems that make up what we call society, right? There's a business sector, if you would, right? There's a educational system. There's a entertainment industry. I mean, all of these different world systems make up what we consider society. Where do we find these different customs, cultures, and these different civilizations? Well, we have to start looking for them in every single world system or every single cosmos. That's what the word world there means in Mark chapter 16. We have to find them in every single cosmos that makes up our culture. Satan has taken the Lord's words literally. The Bible tells us, matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Satan is the god of this world. That word world there again is the Greek word cosmos. Paul wasn't saying that Satan is the god of this world because the Bible tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But what Paul was saying was Satan is the god of world systems. Every cosmos, he has his fingers in it. Let's put that to the test. Is there greed in the business world? Is there lust and just all kinds of mess in the entertainment industry? Come on. Is there corruption in the political world? Absolutely. Satan has infiltrated every single cosmos. He has gone and rather than putting light in those different cosmos that make up society, he is planted and he's put darkness and evil and wickedness. When Jesus was telling those who were listening to him to go into all the world, he was saying go into every single world system in your community. You need to be involved in every single world system. Why? Because I've put something on the inside of you that you need to share with those that you live next to. Yeah, your neighborhood is a world system. It's a cosmos. That, that, that restaurant that you're going to go to here in just a few minutes is a cosmos. That, that school that you attend is a cosmos. That job that you work at is a cosmos. And when we understand that we have a role in this rescue, that our purpose is more than just trying to get to the age of retirement and then just punching it in, right? Listen to me. There's more to life than just waiting around. But we've been given the mandate from heaven to be the difference on this side of eternity. Amen. The cosmos that I want to talk to you guys about specifically today is our education department, our public schools. And so this morning, I just want to declare to you, you guys can put the, the, the slides up on the screen if you can. I want to declare to you that our schools matter. Our schools matter. In the state of Arkansas, we have just over 450,000 students who are enrolled this year in public schools in Arkansas. 
over 450,000 students, and the majority of those students don't know Jesus. Our schools matter. I have just a few little quick stats for you this morning. 28% of U.S. students in grades 6 through 12 have experienced bullying. 70.6% of students say they have seen bullying in their schools. In the 2017 school district, or I'm sorry, the 2017 school year, uh, over 6,000 reported cases of bullying in Arkansas schools alone. Over 6,000 reported cases of bullying in Arkansas schools alone. And this is significant because of that next little staff there that says at least one person every single year, or I'm sorry, at least one person ages 10 to 24 commits suicide every week in Arkansas. Two years ago, I was in a school, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back, last year, my timeline is, is very fuzzy right now, last year, I was in a school in central Arkansas where in one school year, there were eight suicides, the Cabot School District, I'll just call them out, they need your prayer. Our schools are hurting, our schools matter because there's great need, there's great need, Right? Out of that 450 plus thousand students that's enrolled in public schools in Arkansas, 184,000 of those students live in poverty, many of them extreme poverty. They don't necessarily like getting out for summer. You know why? Because they don't know where their next meals are going to come from. When, when, when they get breakfast and lunch at the school, it, it's a little bit easier to live. Most of us probably in this room are going to you know, at least eat something today. Maybe you already have. But many of these students won't. Powerful, powerful. Over 11,000 students reported homeless in Arkansas. The teen pregnancy rate in the state of Arkansas, 16% higher than the national average. I actually found a little clip, it, uh, a little news story back in 2013 from the head of our state health department when they were petitioning to our state legislative branch trying to get them to to do something about that teen pregnancy rate you know stop uh, you know pass a law or something like, like that's going to stop it right but this is significant because that number alone impacts your tax dollars amen we need Jesus our schools matter because of the need. Number two, our schools matter because of the opportunity. I could stand here all morning long and uh, guys give you number after number after number. Last year in the state of Arkansas, over 700 instances where a student, now you don't hear about this on the news, over 700 instances where a student brought a knife, a handgun, or an explosive device to a public school campus in Arkansas. And yes, I am counting sometimes the shotguns in the back glass, right? Okay, yeah. But it's still the same. Our schools matter. But with all the great need, with all the darkness that this generation is facing, it provides us an opportunity. It provides us an opportunity. Schools are in need and we can help. And when we focus on meeting physical needs, it provides opportunities to have spiritual conversations. We are, we are surrounded by a generation that doesn't view the church as relevant in many instances. And it's not because of the lights. It's not because the pastor wears skinny jeans or he doesn't. It has nothing to do with that, okay? It's all about, is the church necessary? We have a generation that hasn't been raised in church that's in our communities right now. They don't view the church as the place where you find truth anymore like we used to 50, 60 years ago. They just view the church, and I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about this one, okay? The body of Christ. They, they view us as just another institution with our own version of truth, but they can find truth in transgenderism. They can find truth in homosexuality. They can find truth in this cult or that cult or this mess or that mess. Why the church? That's why the opportunity is now for us as the church 
to gain ground back with a generation that's lost. And how do we even begin that conversation? We begin to start showing them our faith, not just sharing our faith. How do we do that? We find ways to serve. When you look at our society, and probably many of you could even speak with even greater knowledge than I can about this, but it's broken. It's broken. I don't know the different numbers in this county, but if it's similar to many of the Arkansas counties all over our state, there are kids that are hungry today. There are kids that are homeless. There are kids that are wrapped up in a, a, such a dysfunctional home life. How can we as the church be the difference? It starts by just loving and serving them. And as I look across this congregation, I see a group of people uh, who are just so full and just so talented, who can use their gifts to paint a picture, an accurate picture of what Jesus really looks like. An accurate picture of what Jesus really looks like. How about serving your school by maybe painting the cafeteria, making over a, 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 a teacher's lounge, cleaning up after a football or basketball game? How about maybe even just adopting one of the teachers that attends our church or maybe we just know of someone in our community and we make them our priority that school year, making sure that they have everything that they need to fulfill everything they need to fulfill, to do their job to the best of their ability. The list is endless. There's all kinds of ways that we can serve. Another reason why the opportunity is so great is because the public school is the largest gathering point for students, regardless of race, beliefs, economic, or any other background, the largest collection of teenagers pass through the doors of our local schools each and every day in the fall and in the spring. And not only students, but teachers that don't know Jesus, faculty, staff, and their families as well. Again, the local school connects in uh, church, your local schools connect entire generations and families in your community like no other entity in your area. The opportunity is there. Our schools matter. And thirdly, our schools matter because it's our responsibility. This is sometimes the pushback that I get, and if you're here and this is your position, I'm sorry. I'm just going to be very blunt with you. I believe I've got scriptural backing for this. None of us have been called to just wait for the rapture. I believe in the rapture. And I believe, church, there's going to be a day like we've never experienced. And, I, and to be quite honest with you, maybe I'm a young man, but I can't wait for that day. But I still have a reason for being right here. If there's still air in your lungs, there's still purpose for your being. Amen? It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. If you're still here today, listen, if you're not dead, you're not done, all right? I'm sorry if that rubs somebody wrong, but that's just a clear, easy way of putting it. We have a reason for being here. It's our responsibility. I read to you two verses of Scripture that Jesus himself spoke. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15. We can't afford to wait for them to come to us. They're not going to. Maybe they do. Maybe there's something that happens to where, you know what, uh, they just supernaturally come, and if that happens, that's great, but that's really nowhere in Scripture. Jesus is the one who told us to go. Jesus is the one who told us to go be salt, to go be light. Jesus is the one that told us where to find them in the Scripture. So, I, I, church, I'm just going to take him for his word, and I'm just going to do what he tells us to do. We have to get involved with where they are, go where they are, be the difference where they are. Let me ask you guys a question, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but I'm, I really want to challenge us here this morning. If God called us to reach Asian people, I don't know what the Asian demographic here is in the, in the MENA area, but if God really called you to reach Asian people, What's the best way, or how's the best way to reach Asian people? And I'm not talking about just going down to the, you know, to the China Panda on Sundays, right, and just having the buffet, but I'm talking about I'm, I'm, we go where they are. We go where they are. This is no different. There are people all over our community that's lost without Jesus. 
Yes, the Holy Spirit will draw some men, but He will use you and me in our lives in between Sundays to show them the God that we serve. So how do we even go about reaching our community or even reaching our school? Well, this is where Youth Alive comes in, and Youth Alive is the Assembly of God strategy for reaching the public school system. We are committed to the most basic human right that we believe for every student, and that is to know and have a personal relationship with Jesus. Youth Alive works cross cross denom cross denominationally. That word is always hard for me to say through a wide variety of strategies to empower students to reach students and to connect churches and youth ministries to their school. And here's just a few key strategies that we have. One of them, very important to my heart, it's called Prayer Zone Partners. We believe in prayer. We are a ministry of the Assemblies of God. Absolutely, we believe in prayer. I challenge every single one of you here today to pray. And you say, well, yeah, I do. No, no. Take it to another level. Here's how you do it. Every time you pass through the school zone, you make it a prayer zone. Every time you see a school bus, you pray. Every time you see one of your students maybe walk into this house or maybe, you know, see them in town somewhere, you just, you just say a breath prayer in that moment for this generation. Prayer is never a last resort, but prayer is the very foundation of everything that we are. Pray. For God to move pray for God to open their eyes pray for God to do great things I have a picture of a young man who actually started a prayer group in his school do you, do you guys have that picture right there at the time this picture was taken the young man uh, he actually has his back turned to us I don't know if you guys can see him I'll I'll try to point him out right here that young man was in third grade <clears throat> and he got uh, well I mean you know he just got hungry for prayer and for praying for his school third grade so he goes to his parents and they go to their pastor this is, at, this is actually in Brinkley Arkansas they they go to their parents he goes to his pastor the pastor goes with them and they talk to the school principal can we come and pray every Thursday morning before school for our elementary school this was a young man he had two other friends that actually joined him at the start of this the principal says absolutely you guys can go to the playground every Thursday morning you guys can come and you can pray they did that for a couple of weeks and then they then the young man got a little bit you know bold and he goes back to his principal and he says you know miss principal may we walk the halls and pray and so every single Thursday morning this spring there's a group of students who are being the difference and they're walking the hall on their campus and they're praying for God to do great things if a third grader can start a prayer meeting in the middle of one of the greatest mission fields in our country how can God use you and me we believe in prayer amen the Bible tells us the affectionate fervent prayer of the righteous avails much James chapter 5 a second key strategy that we work to implement and this is one of our 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 best and strongest strategies is what we call student empowerment the best way to reach the campus is by students reaching students you can have a cool snazzy youth pastor who can throw out all the slang okay they can look the part you can have the big events and we believe in that and we're actually a part of some of that and I'll show you that in just a moment but I mean you, you guys listen the best way to reach and impact a community is one-on-one -on -one one person at a time meeting them right where they are last year in the state of Arkansas we trained over 240 students in how to share their faith on campus and we believe that God's raising up campus missionaries is what we call them to 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 be planted on every single campus in the state of Arkansas and and this is the cool thing about this strategy you guys can go to the next slide it doesn't matter what the laws of this land say students will always be our visas onto this mission field because they'll always be allowed to go to school if we can reach students impact train equip students I have a version of the fire Bible here this is one of our best resources okay a student fire Bible put this in the hands of a student 
and they'll do great things. Even a third grader starting a prayer meeting on his campus. God can use students to do the work of the ministry. Our, our third key strategy, and this is very important as well, is what we call student networking or clubs. We would love to have a club on every single campus in the state of Arkansas. A, a club really is, in my mind, the equivalent to a little mini church plant. Because in that club, by the laws of our land, if it's student-led, student-initiated, student-led, students can pray together. Students can worship together. Students can gather around the Word together on campus. What would happen if we had a club on every single campus in the state of Arkansas who were praying over their schools, who were, who were just, uh, guys, just bringing the Word of God into that enemy territory, if you would, and just allowing God to break out all over that place. Our Youth Alive clubs, and you guys go to the next slide, are not just about a Bible club, but we pound it in our students' heads. You've been called to go. And so we challenge these students to use their club as a hub to reach the entire building. This particular club, this picture was taken a few years ago, Madison was a senior in high school, and she got fired up about reaching her campus. She was a senior at Watson Chapel down in the Pine Bluff area. Madison started a Youth Alive Club, and she started with about 20 kids. I believe there's about 21 or 22 faces there looking back at you, but by the time Madison graduated from high school there, she had over 50 kids meeting regularly in a Youth Alive Club. We've had as many as 200 at a club in Central Arkansas, Youth Alive Club, God doing great things through kids. We have a club up in Northwest Arkansas who uh, run right around 80 to 85 students regularly on campus, kids coming to that club so that they can be the difference on their campus. And then lastly, and this is the big event portion of Youth Alive, we have, because of Speed the Light, which Speed the Light is attached to just about everything that we do that's, that's, that's really making an impact. I'm talking about Youth Alive, okay? We have thousands of dollars worth of sound and lighting equipment where we can roll up onto any public school in Arkansas and do a top-notch school assembly for the entire school. Now, I can't preach the gospel per se during those instructional times, so we have night rallies. And just a picture of one of the night rallies that we had the opportunity to be a part of. There's 4,000 kids on that football field here in the gospel, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Lakeside High School. Now, I just showed you guys stats of how bad things are. But no matter how dark it is, they're hungry for what you and I have. There's not a church that we have in the Assemblies of God that could have held that crowd, 4,000. Maybe one but that had been pushing it. But on a football field, that night we had over 400 saved. Amen? Yeah. Jesus made the statement. He said that the fields were white and ready. They are, they are ready. But the problem was not that they're not ready. The problem was, if you guys remember Jesus' statement there, the problem was, <clears throat> pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth more laborers, right? The problem is, is that we, who already are in the family of God, we can't stop going and being the difference. Now, some of you may be like, Chris, you know what? It's easy for you to do stuff like this because, you know, you're still kind of young. And really, I'm not that young. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't look bad for 53, right? Right? I'm just playing. I'm not 53. But I can tell you story after story of some of our seasoned saints making an impact. Whether it's cooking meals, whether it's just giving hugs. I know of a grandma that has a shirt in her church, and on her shirt it says, I love to give hugs. And every time one of these students walks into their after-school program at their church, she's there to hug them. Now, I walked into this church today. And pastor, I don't think that I had so many names shot to me of different ones in this room welcoming me here. 
you guys are one of the friendliest churches that I've ever been to, okay? And I'm not just saying that, but I mean, uh, from the time I walked in the door to Sunday school back, I mean, I had different ones coming and greeting me and just telling me their name. That's powerful. If you guys can do it for, for an ugly guy like me, certainly you can do it for students in this generation that need to know what real love is. How do we reach this generation? And I, I wrestled with this early on. I wrestled with this, and this is what the Lord told me. You, you just love them. Because love transcends any kind of cultural divide. Love transcends language. Love transcends all of that. And when you're talking about a generation to where their picture of love, now, you know what? Some of you guys are just writing me off maybe a little bit right here, but hold on. You're talking about a generation that their picture of love is so dysfunctional. One in three females, I'm talking about teenagers in this state, are abused. One out of three. One in five males, teenagers, are abused. And so when you talk about love, oftentimes they, they, they're, they're going the other way. That's why showing them what this looks like is so powerful. And every person in this room can do that. The same love that you've been shown, the same mercy that you've been shown, he tells us to show it to others. And when it comes down to it, really, it's that simple. I'm here today really as a voice. I believe that God's not finished with our nation yet. I believe that Jesus is coming soon and and I believe that we're living in last days. Yes, yes to all of that. But I don't believe God's finished with the United States of America. Matter of fact, I, I'm just maybe not naive enough to believe that there's going to be at least one more great awakening in this country. I believe that we're going to see the church rise up like never before. But we're going to have to understand that it might involve, which I believe it will involve, us going to them. And a big generation that we better be reaching is these students. And I'll close with this this morning. If, if the, yes, sir, if Ron, Rodney, Rod, not Ron, I'm sorry. Ron, Rod, gotcha. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> if, if there's one thing that I want to leave with you about reaching this generation, it's this. If we don't reach them, Jeannie Mayo says that 80 to 90% of the time when somebody gets saved in this country, they do so on or before their 18th birthday. If we don't reach the students in our schools now, think about this. If the Lord tarries, what's going to happen? They're going to replace you and I. They're going to be the parents in our society, raising up another generation that's just that much further away removed from the church. They're going to be the business women, the businessmen in our communities. They're going to be our presidents, our lawmakers. You think it's bad now. If we don't turn the tide, we're in trouble. And we've been told to do it. So, so really, there's just no excuse for any of us. And I believe that we all have a part to play. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me?